Today we're going to continue the series we've been entitled, Who is the Devil? And this is going to be part nine. Over the last several weeks we have been uh, capturing the contrast by various New Testament authors in the New Testament of the mindset of Satan that was introduced in the garden this mindset that's rooted in what? I want, I think, I will. Remember the Isaiah passage? I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt myself above the stars of God. I will sit on the throne. I, basically, I'll be in charge. I'll call the shots. I'll determine what is good and what is bad and what can be done and what can't be done. And that is the mindset of Satan that was introduced in the garden which was over and against God's will. And we've been looking at how Jesus came to counter this mindset. You guys remember the passage we've looked at several times from Philippians 2, let this mindset be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, how he emptied himself, humbled himself, and submitted himself to, the God, to God the Father, even though he was God in the flesh. When he played the role of a human being, he submitted himself to God. And that is the way of God or the way of righteousness. Now, we've been looking at the verbiage that the New Testament authors use in this contrast, right, between the way or the mindset of Satan and the mindset or the way of God, or we could say Christ for us as Christians, because Christ came to be an antithesis to what the problem and the mindset, the way of thinking that Satan introduced in the garden. And I've, I made mention several weeks ago that we're, we're saving Johannine literature towards the end because that's going to set us up to go into the series that we're going to do on the book of Revelation. And so that's where we are, because and it, it's best this way anyway because nobody, no writer in the entire Bible captures this antithesis, this contrast of the way of Satan and the way of God better than John. Nobody. Nobody draws the line in the stand and says it's black or white better than John. And so we're going to look at and we're going to transition from some of the language that we saw in other Pauline writings and in, in, in the book of James. And so let me show you just by example. Okay, so you guys remember we looked at the wisdom that was contrasted as the wisdom from above, the wisdom from below, the wisdom of God, and the wisdom of the world. And you can look on this chart, you know, the, the usage of this term wisdom, Sophia, in the Greek New Testament, and you can see that it dominates 1 Corinthians. And we, we looked, we captured that. We spent a whole service looking in that letter, shifting between the contrasting mindsets in that letter. Um, then we transitioned to other Pauline letters. And we didn't look in the book of Acts, which is a historiography, and the book of Luke, which dominate using the term spirit. He could have used wisdom, because spirit and wisdom are the same thing, but he chooses to use the word spirit. And it dominates the book of Acts and the book of Luke. But it also is relevant in many of the places that we looked in Romans and 1 Corinthians and in Galatians. So you have the spirit contrasted with the flesh. And you can see here on this graph that the flesh uh, dominates many of the Pauline epistles. It's also in John. It appears throughout other books as well. And these graphs are helpful to see what words or expressions that a given author likes to use and if it may be specific to an audience. Right? Again, like the wisdom, it dominated Paul's writing to the church at Corinth. Why is that? Because in Corinth, there were a lot of philosophers. A lot, uh, and it was, philosophy was a big thing, which is wisdom, you know, moralism. 
And so he was fighting against that worldly mindset. And so he's contrasting that mindset with what Christ introduced as a proper mindset. And that mindset was countercultural. It, it was the opposite of worldly wisdom. And that's what they were clinging to. Even in the church at Corinth, even though Paul had founded the church and spent over 18 months teaching them the word of God, they were still holding on to the wisdom of the world. Whereas he uses flesh in these other letters more often, like especially in Romans, as you see there on the chart. But we're going to see a major shift into what John uses as an expression to capture this mindset that is in opposition to the mindset God wants us to have that was demonstrated in the person of Christ. And that is, as you see on the graph, the world. And this is exponentially more than any of the other terms that we just looked at on the graphs. I don't know if you can see the number here, but it's almost 80 occurrences that appear this word world, cosmos, in the gospel of John. And then if you look at the chart, you can also see that it, it, it appears in 1 Corinthians and in 1 John. And we're going to look in John's gospel and then we're going to look at 1 John over the next coming weeks. And we're going to see how he captured this dichotomy and expressed it in his writings. And to set us up for that, I want to look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, and then we're going to transition into the gospel. But we need to understand this because here's a defining of what the world is in the mind of John so that we can read that back into the gospel, okay? And it says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. How many of you think based on reading that, it would be important to identify what it means to love the world, and it would be important to avoid that because we don't have the love of the Father if we have the love of the world, according to this verse. So he, he defines what the world is and what it offers. Again, this is a mindset. This is a, a, a way of judging. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh... Think about the usage that we've seen with that term thus far, the flesh. The desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Okay, so if it's from the world, it's not from the Father. And who is the God of this world? Satan. So it can be, it can be linked or traced to Satan as well. So you have the world, Satan, over and against the Father, right? So the world offers the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. We're going to talk about what that means here in just a moment. But what does this verse take us back to? Genesis 3 and verse 6. So when the woman saw, this is a perception. This is a way of judging Right? So when the woman saw or perceived that the tree was good for food, was it good for food, really? No. Because God said not to eat from it. Was it a delight to the eyes? Maybe in appearance, visually, literally, maybe, but... Should she have trusted that? The way things appeared? What, what should she have trusted? What God had determined concerning that tree. And that it was, that it was a, a tree desired to make one wise. Where did she get that from? Satan. Satan said, you can eat from this tree. You, you won't die. God said you'll die. You won't die. Actually, it's going to make you wiser. It's going to make you wiser than God. You'll be like God. You will be God. Isn't that what he said? And so she started seeing it that way. Instead of seeing it 
the way God wanted her to see it. No, that tree is going to catapult humanity into something they're going to struggle with from now to the end of the ages. But she saw it the way she wanted to see it. Satan appealed to her desires, desires she had that were not within the boundaries established by God. And she acted, she ate, she gave to her husband, and he ate. Here's the parallel to 1 John 2. When she saw the food was good for food, lust of the flesh. When she saw that it was a delight to the eyes, lust of the eyes. But I want it. I want it. Okay, you can have it. God let them. It, it, it desired to make wise pride of life. Which brings us back to verse 16. Let's define what pride of life means. First of all, you see that I have pride underlined. This is a, a rare usage word in the New Testament. In fact, it only occurs twice. And the other occurrence is in James chapter 4. If you're, if you're familiar with the letter of James, you know chapter 3 flows into chapter 4. You know the substance and the content, what's going on there, the, the, the friction in, in that setting. In James, it's very related. But this is a, a, a false pride. It's an arrogance. It's, it's a boastfulness. And what is it rooted in? I encourage you to go read James chapter 3 and verse 4. We're going to look at part of chapter 3. But here, here it is. It's the pride of what? Life. That word life, bios, you're familiar with that, biology, bios, life, which is usually translated, as you see there, like in the New King James, as livelihood. But it's, but it's things pertaining to this life. Or what's another way we could say it? Things pertaining to what? This world. The pride of life. What is the pride of life? The NET translates it this way, but this is too narrow. They capture part of what it would mean, but it's way too narrow. The NET says the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the arrogance produced by material possessions because they interpret bios as livelihood it includes that, but it's not limited to that. It's all things pertaining to life. It's finding value or worth in the fulfilling of things pertaining to this life, whether that be money, possessions, fame, having a name that's respected, being driven by that. Do whatever it takes to have a name that people respect. Pride of life. You take pride in that. Even if having a good name means you don't represent His name well. That's what dominates your thoughts. You care. You're obsessed with how people see you and perceive you. You want to be honored and respected in this life. You may find, you may pride or find, you know, an arrogance or a fulfillment in your accomplishments. Look at what I've done. Look at what I've achieved. Look what I have gained key word in all of it is i i have this trophy wife i played in the nfl i was in the nba i accomplished and finding value in that the only thing we should find value in as followers of jesus christ is whether or not we are walking in the light faithfully and growing in that and evolving in that and crucifying the flesh along the way. When we are in God's Word and we're learning and we're seeing things, we're putting to death things that are earthly and carnal and worldly and we're not striving for the things that this world is striving for. right? Because if we love those things, we don't love the Father. Okay, so the pride of life is finding 
satisfaction or fulfillment in the things that this life offers. It's, it's a mindset that is focused very much on this life at the expense of having a focus on eternity. He says this, and the world is passing away. You may gain wealth, you may gain fame, you may gain fill in the blank, but it's passing away. And if we put our hope and our stock in the things that we can achieve and accomplish and gain in this life, it's only going to be enjoyed for a limited time anyway. The world is passing away along with what its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. So let's talk about the world and let's see, let's look into the Gospel of John because I think John captures the, the world and the struggle between the world and Jesus better than anyone. So let's start in John 1 in verse 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, the Word, Jesus, was in the beginning with God. Now watch this in verse 10. He was in the world, this is the inhabited world, and the world was made through him, but watch, the, the definition of world changes here more narrowly because John can use the word world to refer to the inhabited world that we all live in. But he can also refer to the world being this thing that is in defiance and opposition to God and the ways of God. So watch this. And the world did not know him. But he has something particular in mind when he says the world did not know him. And this is the irony of John. The world that did not know him was not the, the pagan nations. I'm not saying that they didn't, but that isn't his focus in John. Verse 11 says this. It shows us who the world is. It says he came to his own. His own being the Jewish people, the covenant people of God. And his own did not receive him. Now, this doesn't mean that all Jews rejected him because, because the first people that embraced him were Jews and all of the apostles were Jews. But broadly speaking, he came to the Jewish people at large and by and large, they rejected him. There's no debating who he has in mind here, and the rest of the gospel bears that out. So his own is the world that he was referring to in verse 10 that did not know him. His own people, the covenant people. And matter of fact, when you look in, into John, the inner religious leaders of God's covenant people are the ones that didn't know him. So it was the Jews who were unwilling to obey him and embrace him and his teaching that he has in mind here. Watch, watch the, the antithesis, though. He came to his own. His own did not receive him. But as many as received him, what does it mean to receive Jesus? To embrace him completely and fully, who he is, accepting what he says about himself, and accepting everything he says as well. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. So who was formerly known as the children of God were no longer known or recognized as the children of God because to be qualified to be the children of God, you have to receive Jesus. You have to fully embrace everything about him in order to have the right to become children of God. And then it says it this way, to those who believe, 
in his name. What does it mean to believe in his name? What does his name represent? Everything about him. But in particular, when you, when you study that expression out in the Old and New Testament, it is linked to the word revealed through him. So it's an embracing not only of who he is as a person, but everything he says as one sent from the Father. So as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, as opposed to what? Children of what's the altern what's the only alternative to being a child of God? A child of the devil. We're going to see that in due time. To those who believe in his name, and then he, he expands this, watch. Who were fathered. Notice it's the DSV version because most of the modern English translations say were born, but that's not an appropriate expression when you're talking about a father. Right? A father doesn't give birth, but he fathers, right? He gives the seed. And the seed is the Word of God, if you study the Gospels and let Jesus interpret himself. Who were fathered, not of blood, being a Jew doesn't mean anything anymore, not of ethnicity, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man but of God. So we have this idea here in the earliest verses of John of being fathered of God, and being fathered of God is over and against being an ethnic Jew, or being according to the will of the flesh, we know what that means, or of the will of man. Okay, watch this in John 3. That's why in John 3, Jesus speaks to Nicodemus at night, who was a religious Pharisee, a ruler. Of, he, he was a member of the Sanhedrin. The ruling class judges of Israel. And he comes to Jesus at night. Let me back up here for a second. And set, set, the, set the groundwork. Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night, right? Because he doesn't want to be seen with Jesus during the daytime. So he comes at night. And he speaks on behalf of the Sanhedrin. And this is w what Jesus said to him. And think about what we just read. Let's, let's read these verses again, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were fathered, not of blood, nor of the will of, of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And then in a conversation in chapter 3, that he has with one of the ruling teachers of Israel, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is fathered from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Do you think fathered from above means the same thing that we just discussed in John chapter 1 and verse 12 and 13? Absolutely. Because to be fathered from above is a, is a reference to God because where was God known to be? In heaven above. And he tells, basically he tells Nicodemus, you're not a child of God. How many of you think Nicodemus felt goosebumps over that? <laughs> you're, not a child of, you're not a child of God, Nicodemus. You have to be fathered from above if you want to see the kingdom of God. And then he says it another way in, in, in verse 5 in more metaphorical language. But he means the same thing, so don't be distracted by the metaphorical language. He says, truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is fathered of water and spirit, both being symbols for the word of God, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So seeing the kingdom of God is parallel with what? 
entering the kingdom of God. And that would be having eternal life, being truly being one of God's children in the end. And he's telling Nicodemus this, unless one is fathered of water and spirit, unless one is fathered from above, he cannot see or enter the kingdom of God. The only way we will see and understand the kingdom of God and therefore enter in the end into the kingdom of God is if we are fathered from above, if we are fathered of water and spirit. What does that mean, though? What does it mean to be fathered from above? To receive Him. To believe in His name. To embrace Him. To obey Him. That's what it means. He's just using symbolic language, metaphorical language that they should have been familiar with because of their, their familiarity with the Old Testament. Notice what he does here in verse 6. Draws a line in the sand. That which is fathered of the flesh is flesh. And that which is fathered of the Spirit is spirit. What's he saying? What is Jesus saying? There are two categories of people. There are people who are fathered by the flesh. They live according to this mindset introduced by Satan. And there are those who live according to a, the mindset given by God. And in this context, he's speaking of his self-revelation. Fathered, And he who is fathered of the Spirit is Spirit. So there's two, two mindsets. Those who submit to God's will and those who submit to the will of self. And he says this, do not marvel. A lot of people marvel over this, though. I said to you, you must be, you must be, you have to, you must be fathered from above. And here's why, and here's how, later in that same chapter, First, let's talk about why we must be fathered from above. Because he who comes from above is above all. This is why we call Jesus Lord or King. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. So he's setting himself up against the person who speaks in an earthly way. What's another way we could say that? A worldly way. According to the wisdom of this world. I mean, think of all of the things we've covered thus far. So the reason why we, may be, we must be fathered from above is because Jesus has been sent from above and he is above all. And here's why. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard. Yet no one receives his testimony. Should we take that statement like hyper literally? No one, no one receives this. In contrast to the people that were exposed to what he was saying and witnessing, very few received his testimony. Correct? How many disciples did Jesus have at the end? Eleven and then 120. How many people were there in national Israel at the time that had been exposed? You think of the stories in the gospel, how many multitudes saw miracles, signs, wonders, and still at the end, he only had 11 and 120 after all of that. So, he bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. This is the key, guys, right here. You have to settle it in your heart that God is true. 
And then you put a period after that. God is truth. God is the one who determines truth. God determines good and bad. I don't have a say. What I think doesn't matter. God is true. And how can we understand this? Through the witness of Jesus of what he has seen and heard. And that's why the apostles ministry is so important to the church and that's why it's the foundation because they were there every step of the way hearing every word he spoke hearing the witness that was sent by the father that proved that god is true and showing us what truth is for he whom god has sent speaks the words of god for God does not give the Spirit by measure. What, what is that? What's that all about? God does not give the Spirit by measure. The Spirit being the words of God. But what does He mean He doesn't give it by measure? This is a reference to what we see in the Old Testament. When you read the Old Testament stories, it says, And the Spirit of God came upon Elijah, and he did something, but the Spirit always left. But in John's gospel, when Jesus is baptized, it is said, And whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining, He's the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit came and remained on Jesus. The prophets prophesied by inspiration of God in bits and pieces. There's no bits and pieces with Jesus. He is the fullness of truth because He is the Word of God Himself in the flesh. Right? And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And so He is the fullness of God's revelation whereas the prophets spoke in part. But He is the climax and the fullness of God's revelation. For He whom God has sent speaks the Word of God for God does not give the Spirit by measure the Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. Again, this is why we must be fathered from above in embracing Jesus and everything about Jesus and everything He says. Verse 36 says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him so john here in this verse defined for us what it means to believe or not believe right and what is it what does it mean to believe in the son we we say i, I believe jesus existed i believe he was here two thousand years ago i believed he 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 died was crucified buried raised that that's what i believe is that it? No. Because he defines it in the antithesis. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see light. So to believe in the Son means to what? Fully submit every part of our being to Him in every way. There's, there's no part of us that we're like, no, that's off limits. I'll do everything but. Not this, God. No. We must submit completely and fully did you know that god is an all or nothing god he's lord of all or not at all and john captures this reality better than any writer in the new testament so he defined for us what it means to believe now here's why we have to believe and obey the words or the teaching of jesus based on what jesus says here in John chapter 7. He answered them. My teaching. Or my word. Is not mine. But his. Who sent me. Which is a reference to who? God. Now the key to discerning truth. And understanding his teaching. Is shown in this next verse. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking of myself. 
or as it's translated here, of my own authority, but literally of myself. And that is a, a reference to what Satan does. He speaks of himself. We're going to see that in John chapter 8. But the key to discerning truth is a crucified will by the hearer. If you have a will that doesn't want to do God's will, you're not going to have any spiritual discernment. Remember what Paul said to the church at Corinth, remember, in 1 Corinthians? He said, the carnal mind cannot process or understand the things of God because they are spiritually discerned. And as long as your will is a filter, you're going to be the one who determines truth, not God. But what do we need to set our seal to? God is true. And so our desire to, should be to unbiasedly seek God's will through His Word and that came to us climactically through the person of Jesus Christ. And he's, I mean, you think about the setting here. Jesus steps into a religious world where everybody goes to church. And he's like, if y'all want to be children of God, are you saying we ain't children of God? And he's like, if you want to know whether or not what I'm saying comes from God, or whether I'm making this stuff up, or twisting it to what I want it to, to mean, then you have to, you have to align your will with God's will. And in order to do that, you have to give up all rights. All rights. Not my will, but thine be done. Remember the verses that we looked at early on where Jesus is like, not my will, but thine be done. Over and over. That was his mindset. And that's the mindset we're called to have. In Philippians 2, let this mindset be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He emptied himself. He crucified him. He, he allowed himself to be crucified. He crucified his own will and his own desires. And this is why so many people struggle to come under the authority of God's word is because their will is in the way. Their own desires determine what is true. Well, I want this to be true, so... You know, I'm going to find a verse to like, you know, you know, if I have to take it out of context, that's fine. But I'm going to take this verse and make it mean what I want it to mean so that in the end, my desire is what I can call truth. And then I can feel OK about carrying it out, you know, because, you know, I can assign it to God and his will or his word. We're going to fast forward for just a moment in this verse. Let's read this again. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking of my own authority. This is why the people that he is speaking to, for the majority, don't understand what he's saying and end up killing him. In John chapter 8, he says, You are of your father, the devil, and here's why. Here it is. Right the, circle this. And your will is to do your father's desires. What was... Okay, the father is the devil here. What were the, what were the devil's desires? His own. His own. I will ascend into heaven. I'll, call, you know, I'll be God. I'll call the shots. I'll determine good. All determined bad. Who does God think He is telling me what to do? And that's how they were. Now they went to they went to church, not church, but they went to synagogue. They went to the temple. They would have identified as pious Torah observant Jews. And He says, "You are of your father the devil." And the reason why is is because your will has not been crucified. Your will still calls the shots. And anyone who opposes your will, mm, they end up on a cross. Because they're not willing to put their desires on the cross. 
And that's what people who won't put their own desires on a cross will do. They will put you on a cross. As we'll see they do to him. You are of your father the devil. Your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. Did, should we take this hyper literally? Was Satan in the garden with an axe just chopping Adam and Eve up? No. How did he murder them? Through sweet lies. Truth mingled with lies, twisted, appealing to desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, he, and he does not stand in the truth. Does he use truth? Yeah, manipulatively. Because there is no truth in him. Truth doesn't rule him. When he lies, when he lies, he speaks out of his own. Notice characters italicized because that's not in the original. He speaks of himself. Remember the verse we just looked at in chapter 7? He said, if anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether or not I'm sent by God or if I speak of, my, of myself. So, speaking of yourself is linked to what? The devil. When he lies, he speaks of, of himself, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Now, does he tell only lies? No, he tells some truth. How much lies are required to make one a liar. <laughs> Selah. Let's look at this. Now again, we're looking at this in comparison to John seven seventeen. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. Two opposing mindsets. We see it in James chapter 3. We've covered this a few times in the series already. But it says, but if you have bitter envy and self-seeking, where? In your hearts. Where, where did Satan's conversation begin in his quest to overthrow God? In his heart. Go read it. Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. But if you have bitter envy, what was he envious of? He wanted to call the shots. Who is God to tell me what to do? I want to tell me what to do. I'm going to ascend into heaven and I'm going to take over. Okay, good luck. But if you have bitter envy and what? What is it rooted in? Self-seeking. I want. I think. I reason. If you have that in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above. But is what? Earthly, unspiritual, soulish, emotional, and what? Demonic. So if we see envy, this bitter envy or selfish ambition or self-seeking in ourselves, what are we operating in? Carnality, earthly. Emo we're emotional, and it's also what? Demonic. Why is it demonic? Because it's the behavior of Satan. I want, I will. I'm not getting under authority. Who do you think you are, God? For where envy and self-seeking ex exist, confusion the ESV translates this disorder. Confusion and every evil thing are there. You should do a word study on this word confusion. It occurs five times. You'll never guess where else it appears. <laughs> I double dare you to go check it out for yourself. But this word you can see in the middle is defined in the, in the pie as disorder or insurrection. I got some dictionary entries for us, this copy and paste. This is what this word means. So if we ever feel this way, we can know what the source is. It's not the wisdom from above. So here is the BDAG, 
Dictionary, one of the, one of the best uh, Greek New Testament dictionaries. It is an uns- unsettled state of affairs, a disturbance, a tumult. It is opposition to established authority, disorder, and unruliness. To be me- mentally or behaviorally erratic. To be unsettled. To be vacillating. When I read this, I can't help but think of what James said earlier in his letter. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Here is, here is the Launida Dictionary, the definition of this Greek word. It means to rise up in open defiance of authority with the presumed intention to overthrow it. Man, who does that sound like? Sounds like it was taken straight from Isaiah 14, doesn't it? Or to act in complete opposition to its demands, to rebel against, to revolt, to engage in insurrection or rebellion. Does that sound like Satan? Here is the Lexham Dictionary. It's a, it's a shorter dictionary, but it's instability, anarchy, and confusion. For where envy and the S needs to be read. Sorry about that. And self-seeking exist. Elf-seeking. Um, confusion in every evil thing are there. Disorder, insurrection, rebellion, defiance. Where does that come from? It doesn't come from above, right? It's carnal, emotional, sensual, unspiritual, and demonic. Do you think we're going to see some demonic activity with Jesus in his dialogues? <laughs> and the irony is, what they're guilty of, they accuse Jesus of. Because we're, we're going to see that, that they're like, uh, you're a Samaritan and you have a demon. We can't refute what you're saying, so we'll just attack your character. Uh, yeah, you're a Samaritan, you have a demon. Okay, if anyone's will is to do God's will, that's all it would have taken for the people Jesus is is speaking to, is to have a will to do God's will. And they would have known, yeah, Jesus is sent by God. Yeah, He's the Savior. He's the King. He is the Messiah. We need to fall on our faces and prostrate ourselves and realize that God has granted us a gracious gift in sending us our King. But no. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or or whether I'm speaking of my own authority. He who speaks from himself seeks what? His own glory or or his own honor. He wants to honor himself. When When you get your way, or you do what you want to do, who are you honoring? Yourself. But when you submit your will to God, and you fulfill His desires, who are you honoring? God. But he who seeks the glory or the honor of the one who sent him is true. This is Jesus making a reference of himself. And no unrighteousness is in him. Why? Because you're doing what God wants. What you think or what you want to do doesn't matter. Here's what God wants done. That's what I'm going to do. And you're going to be walking in righteousness. Which is unlike who? Satan. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until what? Unrighteousness was found in you. He stopped doing what God wanted him to do. Did his own thing and he became unrighteous. So he who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true. And no unrighteousness is in him. And this is all rooted in a perception. Can y'all, y'all focus? There, there's, a folk, there's a mindset, a way of judging, a way of perceiving. And that is why Jesus follows this up a few verses later. And he says, do not, ju- do not make judgment according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. This is a fatal statement to the don't judge crowd. Don't judge. The Jesus I serve says we need to judge, but we need to make righteous judgment. 
And we can only make righteous judgment when we remove ourselves and we say, what is God declared as right or wrong, good or bad? We don't judge according to appearance. And you know why he says this? Do not judge according to appearance. Because the Pharisees were masters. I mean masters at making themselves appear to be righteous. Their phylacteries, their, their, their long prayer shawls, their public prayers, when they gave in the offering to like make sure people's watching. Look at me. Do not judge according to appearance. They were so concerned with how they were perceived by the people. They wanted to appear to be righteous. And that's why they hated Jesus. Because he's like, turn the light on. And they were like, ooh. People see our skeletons. You're revealing our hearts. We had the people fooled. Go away, Jesus. Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. You think Eve should have heeded that advice? <laughs> How did she judge? Not with righteous judgment, based on what is said here in Genesis 3 6, based on appearance. Well, it looks good. I want it. It's kind of, kind of, it's kind of delightful to the eyes. It's going to make me wise. Do not judge according to appearance, but with righteous judgment. Which is the same thing that he says, but says it a different way in chapter eight. He says, "You judge according to what." The flesh. So judging according to appearance is judging according to the flesh. And Jesus says, I judge no one. And it's obviously implied according to the flesh. Of course, he doesn't judge anyone according to the flesh. But watch what he does say. Yet, even if I do judge, my judgment is true or right. Why? For it is not I alone who judge but I and the Father who sent me. So he says, even if I do judge, my judgment is true or righteous. Why? Because he has submitted himself to God's judgment of truth, of what truth is. And so he says, it's not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. And I always am taken back to John 5, when I read that verse. And this is, guys, this is one of the best verses for you to memorize right here. This is the mindset that Paul is calling for the Philippians to have, the mindset of Christ. Here it is right here. I can do nothing on my own. Jesus said that as a human. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just. Why? Because I seek not my own will. Guys, in all of the years that I've been in church and especially in ministry dealing with people, the hardest thing for people to put to death is their own will. It's never ending. I seek not my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. That's why He says my judgment is true. It's not my judgment. It's me agreeing with the Father. And allowing what the Father has declared as so. And that's where, how do we respond to that? Obviously, we weren't in heaven with Jesus, or with God like Jesus was. He came to the earth. And He's revealing the words and the thoughts of the Father. So how are we going to know? 
how are we going to be able to make righteous judgment so that our judgment is true like Jesus? How are, how are we going to come to be able to do that? By going back to chapter 7, aligning our will with a desire that is fueled by doing God's will. Removing ourselves, we put ourselves to death. And we're like Jesus, not my will, but thine be done. And we get ourselves out of the way. And then we have to. What? As I what? As I hear, I judge. We have to hear the word of God. Take in the word of God. Hear means to. To. Put into practice. But we have to get, but for us, what do we need to do on our end? Can we put it into practice if we are never learning it, reading it, meditating on it, studying it? Right? You can't hear it, you can't hear it and obey it if you don't expose yourself to it. So, what is that going to require? Time, time that is willing to be spent in His Word. And what is that going to be rooted in? A value for His Word. And that's all, that all starts with, I can do nothing on my own. I'm just a mere mortal human. I need guidance. And the great news is the Creator has given us counsel and guidance through His Word. Are we going to get into that and let that be the judgment that we use in this life? Or are we just going to wander through life? Well, well this, I think this is right. I think this is what God wants. When we can get into His Word... And as we hear, we judge, and our judgment is just. And we are walking by the same mindset that was demonstrated in Christ. And, and again, this is a counter mindset to the mindset of Satan. He didn't want to submit his will to God's will, did he? He said, no, I'm tired of it. So if we ever find ourselves in a place, and this can easily happen, guys, where, man, I no longer want to do what God wants me to do. I kind of, I think I'm going to kind of take over here. Man, we need to put the brakes on. We need to put the brakes on. We need to fall on our faces. We need to cry out to God. We need to humble ourselves, empty ourselves. Pick our cross back up. And follow Him. Because it's in Christ being willing to die on His own cross that He was raised again and honored by the Father. So my question is to us as I close, how are we going to judge? Are we going to depend on God? Or are we going to make judgment through the flesh or based on appearance, based on what we want. The good news is we have a good handbook to guide us, to transform us. Listen to me. The world is trying to speak into our soul. The world is trying to shape and conform our minds into the norm of this culture and society which is driven by everything that God does not desire. Who are we turning to for guidance? Any questions? Amber's looking at the slides back there, and she's like, you had 80 slides. Why are we stopping at 50? 
because I'm looking at y'all's countenances and y'all don't want me to go to 80. <laughs> so we will cover that next week. Any questions? Well, let me ask you a question. How many of you find it to be insulting or oppressive to hear that you need to submit your will completely and fully to God? Does that come across as oppressive or like, God, he's just this mean control freak? Anyone? He's so much, so much wiser than we are. He's been around a while. You ever think about that? No beginning. Okay, let me, let me understand that. No beginning. I need to lay down. And I was thinking about defying him and not doing what he wanted me to do. We've all been there. Let's not stay there. Let's seek him while he can be found. We have his word. Let him guide us. Would you stand? If you want some homework.